Hey, Christopher here. Quick thing to tell you about. We are coming up on episode 100 of the Musicality podcast. Crazy. This has been an incredible journey so far, and I'm truly honored that we've been able to feature some of the world's most impressive and fascinating music educators, delivering powerful insights that can help you do more in your musical life. To celebrate hitting the 100th episode, we wanted to do something special, and as I looked back on all the episodes so far, I thought that what would be most useful would be a way to help you get all the powerful ideas and techniques and strategies from those episodes in one place for easy access. So we've put together a special limited edition collection for you, featuring every single episode, along with a ton of extra resources to help you get the maximum impact on your musical life, plus a bunch of cool bonuses contributed by our amazing guests. This is going to be available for a limited time only, so whether you've just listened to a few episodes or you've been with us all the way since episode one, please check out all the details at musicalitypodcast.com slash celebrate because you won't want to miss this. It's musicalitypodcast.com slash celebrate. Hi, this is Marshall McDonald of the Count Basie Orchestra and you're listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. Today I have the distinct pleasure of talking with someone who I think it's fair to say is one of the top jazz musicians in the world today and who has played with and learned from some of the true masters. Marshall McDonald, who has been playing for 20 years with the legendary Count Basie Orchestra and currently plays lead alto sax in that band. He's also performed in the Duke Ellington Orchestra and with Lionel Hampton and Paquito de Rivera. I'll admit that I was a bit nervous going into this interview. Marshall has had an amazingly impressive career, and although I'm a jazz fan, I'm not a jazz musician myself. And I know that jazz cats often have an encyclopedic knowledge of jazz records and jazz history and the musicians behind it all. Marshall is certainly no exception, but fortunately he's also the most lovely and humble guy and it was an absolute pleasure to chat with him. And he certainly didn't hold back on the amazing stories and insights on teaching and learning jazz and music in general. One might assume that a world-leading jazz alto sax player would talk mostly about the specifics of jazz and saxophone. But as you'll hear, Marshall has a breadth of wisdom and insight that cuts right across music itself. There is a ton in here for any musician to learn from. In this conversation, we talk about talent and how he and the amazing musicians he's worked with and learned from think about talent. I ask him about learning to improvise and the balance of preparation versus spontaneity to improvise in a way that moves the listener. And he helps me to shrug off a grudge I'd been harboring for 20 years and realize that some advice I got way back then was actually pretty solid. Marshall is a natural storyteller, so I can say without bragging that this is a really fantastic interview. I take no credit. He's also a skillful educator, offering private lessons online and giving masterclasses, so he really knows how to explain what he does. Between the stories and the insights, I know you're going to love this one. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Marshall. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so I'm glad to be here. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. You are at the top of your game as one of the world's leading jazz musicians, and I would love to understand how that came to be. Um, where did you get started in music? Was it jazz to begin with, or did you start at an early age? What's, what's the backstory for Marshall McDonald? No, it was it was classical studies. My father was an oral surgeon, and it, I was born in, in 1959. All of the children took lessons, and my brother was already a child prodigy on on trumpet, quite advanced. Uh, he's eight years my elder, and uh, what's interesting is my mother had him babysit me in my crib, and I was told later that he used to practice while I was sleeping. Because I, I, I used to, I told my mother as I got older, I started singing two things. I started singing the Haydn Trumpet Concerto and the Vivaldi Trumpet Concerto. They still sit in my mind. Um, so, so, so I think somewhere along the line, hearing my brother, who was, who was quite advanced, uh, uh, hearing my brother practice somehow instilled something in, in me about the whole concept of music and practice. 
Wonderful. That's uh, quite a, a childhood experience. I think not many people get serenaded by trumpet in their crib, particularly <laughs> when they're trying to sleep. <laughs> it clearly true. didn't do you any harm. So when you got to the age of learning music yourself, um, were you following in your brother's footsteps on trumpet or what did music learning look like for you? Well, I started on clarinet and of course my father got me some lessons down at Carnegie Mellon University where my brother was studying. And every Saturday he put us in the car and took us down there. My first teacher was the principal clarinetist of the Pittsburgh Symphony. My father, uh, being a professional in the medical world, he, he actually played piano himself. He loved classical music. So he would practice with us, uh, you know, on the piano. And my mother also played piano. We all had to take piano lessons and that kind of thing. And that's, that's how I started out. And was it enjoyable for you from day one? Did you take to it like a duck to water? I, I think I did. I, you know, I, the, the good thing is my parents didn't put too much pressure on it. I, you know, I was I was I was supposed to practice 30 minutes a day, according to the teacher. Um, and I, I, I ended up liking it. So I, I did practice by the time I was in eighth grade or whatever that year that whatever, however old you are. I was playing the Mozart clarinet concerto. Um, I did stop playing the piano, which I wish I had kept up. And I think my mother was tired by then, but, you know, like the third kid, you know, she, I was like, Mom, I don't want to play, play the piano. She's like, OK, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so my brother kept on playing the piano. And as he got older, he actually played uh, piano, uh, bass, guitar and trumpet. Uh, so he, he was he was quite accomplished in that. Wonderful. And so you were playing clarinet through high school, presumably, and you went on to study music at college. Is that right? Uh, kind of. So, so, um, what happened was, uh, in, in eighth grade, uh, I found a, a, an eight track cassette. I bet none of your listeners even know what that is, but <laughs> it's a gigantic looking tape. We used to put in a gigantic machine to listen to music. Uh, I found a cassette tape in, in my father's collection of Louis Armstrong. It was a whole low dolly record. See, up until that point, he basically just played opera and classical music all around the house all of the time. Um, and, and as you can imagine, it's a very, very educated family. My mother had a master's degree. So going to the library and doing your studies, things are uh, honestly, it was different in, in the 60s and 70s. They had three TV channels. Parents kind of controlled your life. You remember those days? So I heard this tape and I heard Hello, Hello, Dolly. And I just fall in love with it. Basically, I just love the jazz on it. And there was a clarinet player on the recording. It might have been Barney Bagard that I found out later, but it, it didn't matter. I just, I thought it was the greatest thing. Now, what I did know was my mother grew up in Pittsburgh and went to a famous school, Westinghouse High School, where Earl Garner and Grover Mitchell and Earl Father Hines and Mary Lou Williams and all, Williams and all of these great black musicians had gone. See, in that time, the towns were segregated, so there were only two areas where black people lived. And one of the schools had a great musical teacher, and he was producing a large number of, of, of really great musicians. So Pittsburgh has a tremendous history in jazz. She told me later that she loved jazz as a child and went to see jazz players. She actually used to listen to Earl Garner practice. Uh, and, and I'm just going to jump into practice because a lot of people said that the Earl Garner didn't read music. They possibly learned later that maybe he had uh, some kind of, um, you know, dyslexia or something. They're not sure of why he couldn't read the music. So a lot of people assume if you can't read music, it doesn't make you as accomplished musician. Uh, and that's just not true, first of all. Uh, what, what she did say that all she remembered was Earl Garner practicing all of the time in the cafeteria on the piano. And I think that's the key, <laughs> you know, just, just practice, you know, no matter what your gift is. Wonderful. Well, that's definitely something I'd like to come back to in a little bit, the gift and practice. Um, but I don't want to leave the story there. You were enraptured with Louis Armstrong and that Hello Dolly record or 8-track. Um, what impact did that have on you? Did you immediately abandon the classical world and run off into jazz? Oh, no, of course not, because uh, uh, <laughs> once, you, once you study music, you're always studying music. Uh, most jazz musicians are playing A2s and close-A studies. Charlie Parker played out of the close-A book and actually had several of them memorized. Uh, every, every musician studies, studies both worlds. Uh, it's all music, whether it's country music or blues or bluesgrass. There's only 12 uh, notes from the European scale. Uh, well, basically what happened, most of my father's chagrin... <laughs> 
<laughs> I, told, I told him I wanted a, a saxophone because when I got to high school, I wanted to join the jazz band. He wasn't too happy about that, but because he loved me, he bought, he bought me a saxophone so I could learn it. And he teased me about it, but I started practicing it and, 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 and got pretty much got it together through my clarinet teacher. And I did join, I actually joined the, the stage band in 10th grade of whatever you are, 13, I think at that mm-hmm. time. Wonderful. It's great that your dad was happy to support you in that way. I, um, I, I'm not going to try to draw comparisons between your musical career and my own, but I wanted to learn saxophone myself in high school, and I was told I could not learn saxophone until I first mastered the clarinet. <laughs> and so I had four years four years of clarinet being told I had to get the clarinet on the just right before I was allowed a saxophone. And then the, finally that day came and I was able to join the wind band and play sax and life was much better. <laughs> Well, that's a good story. You reminded me uh, when, when I first started out as a child wanting to play, I, I picked the oboe and a very wise teacher said the exact same thing. He said, you, your son should start on clarinet. If he plays clarinet, he can move to any of the woodwind instruments after that. It, it was a great advantage for me because uh, uh, many saxophone players have so much trouble going back to the clarinet. There was a time back when, when the, the big bands were started that everyone started on clarinet. You know, the, uh, for, the clarinet is the home instrument. They are correct. Being home, that is, if you can learn to play clarinet and master the clarinet, you can move to many of the woodwinds from there. But moving from the flute or saxophone to the clarinet is extremely difficult. Interesting. I'm, I've been harboring a grudge for 20 years, and I'm going to have to finally let it go. <laughs> Clearly, the <laughs> advice I got given was actually valid. They weren't just trying to fill spots in the orchestra that had an empty clarinet seat. <laughs> you, you know Artie Shaw, the great, great clarinet, one of the greatest ever, mm-hmm. the great classical player. He was also a great lead alto saxophone player. Interesting. Well, it, it certainly jumped out at me that you play all saxophones and woodwind instruments. Uh, you know, for a musician as accomplished as you are on you know, for someone to play lead alto in the Count Basie Orchestra, I don't think people would expect that you had also reached such a high level on other instruments. Um, maybe we could just touch on why that is possible for you. That that basically came out of uh, my professor at University of Pittsburgh. My, my father taught at University of Pittsburgh. So I, I, I believe it or not, I, I, you asked me, did I go to college for music? No, I actually started off for two years studying biology and chemistry to, to become a doctor like my sister. So that's... That, that, that's how I started out. Uh, when, when the band director found out that how much I really liked music, uh, he actually made a special arrangement for me. Mark Kirk was a student of Phil Woods who lived in the Poconos. I was going to Lafayette College, which is very close to the Poconos where Phil Woods was living. Well, he had a, a prize student up there. His name was Mark Kirk, who I had met at, 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 at one of these jazz concerts. My band director at Lafayette arranged for me to get a van drive into the mountains and take a few lessons with Mark Kirk. Uh, The things that he taught me in those few lessons, which, believe me, I did not understand very well. And he was a little frustrated with me because he was so advanced. And uh, he, he, but the things he taught me when I finally got them together years later were, but changed my whole playing concept. And I still teach them today. Amazing. Could you give an example or two of what he taught you in those lessons that you've come back to all these years later? I sure could, because Phil Woods is or was one of the best uh, jazz saxophone teachers out there. And so many of his students that you know are playing, uh, Vincent Herring and and, and so many others, all all over the place, John Gordon, um, Richie Cole. The first thing that, that he did is I brought out these fake real books, you know, those, you know, with the fake charts and stuff. And I had all this music and all this stuff. And Mark took it and he threw it on the ground and he said, never come back to my house again with those. OK, <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was the first thing he said. <laughs> he said to play jazz, you have to listen to jazz. You have to learn to hear jazz. And you have to learn your scales and your chords. That that was the first lesson. He wrote out a Phil Woods exercise, uh, which I still have and still pass on to students, which involved a, a chord change. I didn't know that at the time. It was a minor scale, a dominant scale with a diminished scale over top of it and a major scale, pretty much going up to the ninth. da 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 that was the pattern, and it continued through the diminished and going on to the major. That was my first lesson. Now, 
it took years for me to, because he said, you have to learn this in all 12 keys. Like, you know, I'm a bio biology major, and this was one of the first <laughs> jazz lessons I really had. So when I came back and I hadn't quite figured it out, he was a little frustrated because, you know, uh, the way he taught and Phil taught is he would sit at the piano and play chords, you know, which is the way it was when I studied with George Coleman. He sat at the piano and played chords. Um, so it took a while to get that together. Now, you asked me about the saxophones. I, I you know. It was, it was Dr. Nathan Davis. When I came back to Pittsburgh and transferred to the University of Pittsburgh, I started as a music major then. Dr. Nathan Davis was one of the first who started a jazz program in the United States at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, he and, um, see, 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 you get older, you can't remember nothing, right? David Baker. David Baker and Dr. Davis were some of the two first who started a jazz program. The schools at that time didn't really accept the jazz degree, though. You know, it wasn't really acceptable. So it had to be something else or ethnomusicology or something like that. Uh, one, one, one day, uh, uh, Dr. Davis said, Nathan, Nathan said to me, he said, you're really focused on bebop and alto saxophone." But he said, you know, music is very difficult to make money in. And he said, you, you have to learn to do a lot of different things. For instance, this is a quote, you can't be a janitor and walk in here and say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't clean tile floors. That, that's exactly what he said. And after he said that, he, I think he handed me a soprano saxophone from the rental office and said, please go home and start this. And so you see where I'm going. Uh, later on, later on, he gave me a tenor saxophone. I said, "I need you to take this home and, and learn how to play this." Then he had me playing baritone saxophone in the band. So that that's really how it happened. So what I learned was that each saxophone is a separate voice, though. You can't play the tenor like you play alto. You can't use the same airstream. You can't use the same concept, or you're going to sound like an alto player playing tenor. <laughs> Interesting. And it sounds like some really uh, amazing people were taking an interest in you at this phase. Um, what do you think they saw in you that they were willing to kind of invest in you in this way? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little crazy then. I was young. Uh, I, I guess the one thing they saw was I was willing to work hard. The band went mm. to Trinidad and Tobago. And, uh, you know, and we had we also had jazz seminars where James Moody and Freddie Hubbard and Grover Mitchell and everyone would come in Pittsburgh. There were also some very great local musicians, Eric Kloss. There was a group of young musicians, Ned Gould, Frank Molly, Andy Fight, Dave Budway, uh, Leon Lee Dorsey. Many of them moved up to New York and they were more advanced than me. Ned Gould went to play with the Harry Connick Orchestra. Dave Budway played with people in New York. Leon Lee Dorsey has a doctorate, played with Art Blakey and Lee and Lionel Hampton. So there was a heavy scene. You know, Eric Kloss was mm -hmm. there. He was a staple. He was a child prodigy. And so it, 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 it was something going on in Pittsburgh. So I, I didn't just learn from Dr. Davis. I learned from these guys. For instance, Frank Mahler was a tremendously talented and advanced trombone player. The way he learned to play was he had transcribed... <laughs> I'm not even sure how many. He he knew how many. Uh, when I say transcribe, he learned solos off of records, and they were records, everyone. They were records. He <laughs> off of records, memorized them, and he knew at least four hundred or more of them. And so when he would come over to my house, to, well, not a house, to my little room in those days, if he put on a Miles Davis record of J.J. Johnson, he could play along with the solo without reading any music. So one day I said, I said to him, Frank, how can I learn how to play jazz? And he said to me, this, this is what Pittsburghers talk like this. You know, they talk through their nose. He said, you know, Marshall, you know, you got technique. You got a good sound. You just need to listen to the big birdie. I said, the big birdie? Who's that? He said, Charlie Parker. All you need to do is just transcribe a bunch of Charlie Parker solos. <laughs> what he told me was, and he thought, playing along with Jimmy Abersole records and reading solos and learning to read chords in that way didn't teach you to play jazz. And then as I got with a lot of the heavier musicians in town, every one of them said the same thing. You have to learn to hear, to play, to play any music, basically. 
Interesting. So I want to circle back in a little bit and talk more about transcribing and that process of learning jazz. Um, but let's continue with the story for a little bit. So you were immersed in this amazing Pittsburgh scene um, and studying at this point, you'd switch to ethnomusicology to cover your jazz program. No, I, I made a self a self designed major. You know that they were just coming oh, up with the jazz major, and I, I picked courses. And honestly, I was, I was, there was a lot of partying going on in those days. So <laughs> I was, basically, maybe what they saw me that I was willing to practice a lot. So when I said we went to with Trinidad and Tobago, I, he had given me a soprano, and I was playing lead alto on saxophone. I basically was an alto saxophone player in, at, at the time. I got a flute in high school to learn how to play flute because I knew they had those in the parts. And uh, I used to sit on the on the bus. They had some kind of bus. They would take us places. So everyone was at this party, you know, including including Nathan Davis, which is a funny story. He came running out of the party because we're in Trinidad. Apparently, some lizard had run up his pants, right? And he's like running around, ah, help me, help me. <laughs> but what I was doing was I actually was on the bus for hours practicing the soprano saxophone. So, And people were reminding me, they said, you know, you basically, you didn't go to class and stuff, but you sat in the practice room downstairs and used to practice six or eight hours a day. I, I, I'm going to jump in with something I know you're going to ask. And, and, and you, were, you, you want to talk to, people are always curious about talent. How do I learn music? What's the process? How do I enjoy music? It's really simple. First of all, you have to remember why you enjoy music in the first place. That's the, that's step one. Don't look at it as work. What song do you like? What song moves your heart? As in, have you ever listened to a song or listened to the words and it makes you cry? For sure. So any, any person in the world can play music. I'm not saying that any person in the world can be Michael Brecker because that's just not true. That's like saying anyone can be Mozart. No, there's only those people are like alien beings. <laughs> They're like from another planet. There's only going to be one Mozart, one Beethoven, one Michael Brecker, one John Coltrane, one Dizzy Gillespie, one Charlie Parker. Those are surely the masters that show us the way. But that doesn't mean we all can get enjoyment out of music, whatever level we're on. So the first thing is just remember the joy of the music. Now, how did how did I start to learn jazz? I had classical teachers, so they basically couldn't tell me anything of what to do. They didn't know, but I was in the jazz band. A kid came up in 10th grade, and uh, he had he had actually had a jazz teacher on saxophone, so he knew about chords and stuff, and he sounded pretty good. And I'll be honest, I was envious. <laughs> you know, I, was, I was two years older, and I was a little bummed out. I, I never was taught that stuff. My classical clarinet player was like, oh, I don't know. You know. <laughs> he didn't know. So um, I had a solo my senior year, and this kid was in 10th grade, and, he, he, and we're still friends on Facebook, by the way, you know, and he, he was good. But so what? this is what I did, and this is what I think everyone should remember. Uh, I, I, went, I recorded the band where my solo was supposed to be. I took the tape home, and night after night, I sat there, and I sung what I thought that I might play along with the recording, Right? So whatever it was I was singing, I slowly wrote that down on a piece of paper. And this went on night after night. You know, I would listen to record and I'd maybe, you know, like a do 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 ba da ba do ba da. You know, I would just sing. I had no idea what I was singing at all. But whatever it was I would, you know, I, the technical scale of it, I, I, I just knew it was the key of G after that. I was still a little confused. So I wrote out this whole solo. Then I memorized my solo, what I had sung, right? And so we're down at Duquesne University, and my father did come. Remember the man, Muster Chagrin, who, who one, and one day had told me, uh, son, you know, the, the saxophone sounds like a tugboat. Do you really have to play that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you know about that. But my dad came down to this thing, and I won the award for best soloist of the band. So how, how should you learn jazz or any music? And whether it's classical, jazz, rock and roll, first of all, don't isolate and say it's jazz and there's a special way to play it. It's music. The classical masters could all improvise. Mozart, Beethoven, improvising is actually just spontaneously composing. That's all it is. Mozart could improvise because he had a mastery of harmonic progressions, chords, where they should go, 
all of the scales, all of the patterns that he could possibly play. There's a famous story of Mozart sitting down and, and what they called variations on Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, maybe while he was drinking, I don't know. <laughs> and no one knows no one knows if the story is true or not. But the point is, and I, I know this from studying classical music, that the masters could improvise. And that's simply making up spontaneous composition. It's the same as composing. So when you improvise jazz, you're not really making things up or in the moment or jamming. It has <laughs> it's none of that. You know, it's basically studying scales, chords, patterns, devices, understanding the harmony, writing it down, completely absorbing it into your mind, just like Mozart. As you know, Mozart didn't write at a piano. He sat with a paper and wrote out a complete symphony from his mind. That, that, that's what I'm talking about. A, a great jazz player has absorbed so much of the music that they can spontaneously compose a solo full of the devices and, and the things they've learned. Now, how does that relate to a, a young person or a young adult who just wants to enjoy some music? I think they should think like guitar players. <laughs> you, know, you know how guitar players get a rock record and learn the riff off just off the record or learn the song? Honestly, I believe in the Suzuki method for piano, learning to hear by ear first and not reading music first. When, we, when, when our mother spoke to us, she didn't write down something that had us read it. We just spoke back what we heard. And so what happens in the lessons when I was young, because my ear was good, my piano teacher was frustrated because I, I wasn't reading the music. Who, I don't remember who it was. The person would demonstrate the song, and many times I could just play it back by ear, and then she she or he figured that out and got angry with me and, and told my mother, he's, he's not reading the music. You know? <laughs> so, and my brother was even much better at it than me. <laughs> so I know I'm talking a lot and probably going to have to edit this out. <laughs> no, I wouldn't edit a word. There was so much packed in there that I would love to talk at length about. Um, I, one thing to pick up on is just, I love that you were using your voice. Just instinctively, you decided to sing your solo before trying to write it down. Because it's something we really harp on at Musical U. I, you know, a lot of instrument players are reluctant singers, but we really try and get across to them that, you know, if you can imagine it in your mind and then use your voice to explore it or express it, that's such a powerful tool for you yeah. to not have to worry about the fingers on the instrument at, when you're in that creative moment. And particularly for something like improvising, where you want to get to that pure kind of instinct for expression. But I also love that you described there that process of kind of stockpiling patterns or vocabulary or um, systems like chords and scales to kind of equip yourself for that spontaneous composing um, that's really, really interesting to hear about for, a, you know, a, a top level improviser and jazz musician like yourself. It's so fascinating to hear how you think about this stuff. Honestly, I think all musicians think the same way. So I, I, I've been blessed to I started off at the Lionel Hampton Orchestra. So I, I got to sit with some great musicians there. And I've, I've, I've been fortunate to meet almost everyone who was alive, either through Lionel Hampton or basically, honestly. Clark Terry, Art Farmer, George Benson, Frank Foster, Frank West, uh, Danny Turner, uh, uh, James Moody. Uh, I, I played with Poquito de Rivera. My point is this. After talking to all of these great musicians, there's, there's nothing. None of them said that there's no magic to this whatsoever. You know, it, it's all a craft. And there was a bass player in Pittsburgh who told me that one day. Uh, his nickname was Joe Blow. I forgot what his name was, but that was, that's what he called himself. And so I was trying to learn bebop. All those people I mentioned were much more advanced than me, you know. And one day he said to me, Marshall, it's a craft. This is, this is, not, this is not magic. It's a craft. You're, you're going to have to memorize chord numbers. Like when you think of a scale, like a pianist first learns one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. We then have to attach those numbers to every scale, right? That's, that's, that's the first step, just like a piano player. So when, when I was taught from the Phil Woods lesson, when I practice, and this is painful for people because it takes a long time. 
You know, Michael Brooker practiced about 16 hours a day, but uh, Charlie Parker practiced 15 to 16 hours a day every day for a period of three years. Sonny Stitt said he practiced eight hours a day for 10 years. Um, and, uh, the classical players are, are just as extreme. You know, I, I, I've talked to uh, piano players who would practice 10 hours a day. You have to take a break. So, you, but, uh, uh, this, so about the number system, how to improvise. When you take a scale, you have to assign a number to the scale. And this is the way I teach on Skype or any, any person. And this is, this is the same thing Berkeley does, too, now. It's a number system, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that is, if I'm talking to you, I have to be able to know a note. If I, if, for instance, if I say to you, what, what's, the, what's the fourth note of E-flat major? Yeah, uh, <laughs> A-flat. Okay, so that, that was too late because the, the, the chord yeah, already went The moment's by. gone. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what George Coleman told me. Sometimes when I would hesitate, he said, it's too late, Marshall. <laughs> it, it, he said, the piano player already played that E-flat and you missed it. So, see, so, so what, what, how I practice was painfully slow, at times literally punching the music stand in frustration. This is the way I would practice. C, 1, D, 2, I would say it out loud. E, 3, F, 4, that's how I practice. Very, very slowly. I, I learned later that Barry Harris, that I, I had figured out something on my own that was was right because Barry Harris teaches or used to teach the same way in New York. People would sing like this: "I am singing a major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What I was doing myself was exactly what the masters were teaching. So it's not magic, but we want say we're the beginner student or the middle student. We want to have some fun. We're not going to become professionals, right? We need to make this fun. So my brother taught me a lot. He said, if you want to learn to hear, play a TV theme song by ear. Play Happy Birthday by ear in different keys. Play Mary Had a Little Lamb. If you hear a rock song you like, he said, don't go buy the music. He said, just learn it by ear. How do we learn by ear? Humans sung first before playing instruments. Singing is the root of all music, classical music especially. I can't tell you how many times I was sitting with my piano, with my father playing piano, and he's playing the Mozart concerto part on on piano, and he's going, "Sing, Marshall, sing!" <laughs> right. So if you watch a master pianist breathing at the spot they should breathe, right? They go. <laughs> because they're, they're, they're thinking like a singer, and so. I know I got a lot to say. You might have to make two podcasts, man. You might have to make two hours, you know, but but <laughs> but <laughs> I love David Sanborn. I love rock music. I love classical music. I love music in general. I grew up in rock music because it was the 60s and the 70s. My brother went off to Air Force and he left a pile of records before my dad threw them out. <laughs> it, it was Sergeant Pepper's. You know, remember the Beatles record? It was Jimi Hendrix. Uh, uh, what, what, what they call the one Purple Haze was on it. You know, it was all it's the electric all, ladyland, something like that. It was all those records, right? So I'm listening to these. I heard my brother listen to them, but I, I, I really love the Beatles, man. You know, and and then I and then I someone a sax player said and, and from college, if you like saxophone, you need to listen to David Sanborn. He had his first record in the '76, so he, he had me buy the 1977 record named named Sanborn, which I listened to. I wanted to play. I tried to copy David Sanborn off of the records. I actually had the scales wrong. I didn't know what he was playing, but I would just pick the notes off by ear. Amazing. And so it was very much kind of an immersion, ear-led, and very practice-heavy learning experience for you by the sounds of it. You know, this wasn't uh, one of these mythological stories of the great jazz musician who just kind of dabbled on the instrument and had a gift and uh, had amazing success with it. You were clearly putting in the work and surrounding yourself with amazing, inspiring people that you could learn from. I, I, I think the key was, though, was I just enjoyed, uh, honestly, I just enjoyed listening at the records. I, I, mm. I, I, I didn't really play in any bands in high school, so I wasn't smart enough to figure out to learn songs off of records. All guitar players do. 
you know, pretty soon they're playing a jam off, you know, they're playing Led Zeppelin or something. I, I never figured that out because, honestly, I was really immersed in this classical clarinet and reading the music, and I was just trying to figure out this improvising thing. There was a guitar player in school who was really playing bebop, really good. I mean, and I, I, I'm still friends with him now. He lives in Sweden. But he had somehow figured out that you just get a bunch of records and transcribe solos, but I hadn't quite, I hadn't quite figured that out as yet. So we've talked a little bit about the kind of preparation work and study that goes into being able to improvise in terms of learning scales and chords and teaching yourself this numbering system to understand the notes of the scale. But you, you made a comment in one of your blog posts that I loved, which was, I, I think, something that a lot of our listeners could relate to, which you said, a lot of jazz is calculated brain music. Jazz should have three things, dance, melody, and blues. I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit, because if it's not just preparation and careful kind of logical planning of which notes to play, where, where does that great improvising come from? The, well, the, I'll, I'll talk about the first quote. The, the, uh, one, Jackie Kelso was playing lead alto when I first joined the Count Basie Orchestra. And I, 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 I did not really know who Jackie Kelso was, but I quickly learned that he was part of the Wrecking Crew. Do you know what the Wrecking Crew is? Mm, that, that was yeah. the great recording group of Los Angeles, Hal Blaine, Carol Kay, who were recording on a past Johnson, recording on like the Beach Boys, Glenn Campbell. Uh, Jackie Kelso was part of that recording group. He had he was actually in retirement by the time Grover Mistral bought him back from Los Angeles to play. I think what all musicians need, and I think what anyone needs in life, is always to have mentors. I've always searched out and found, been lucky to find mentors. I don't think you can get anywhere without a mentor. So, and, and you're never, you're always learning. You know, whether whether you're my age or whether you're twelve. You know, for instance, my mentor first was my brother, and then my father, and then and then and then uh, 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 Mr. Thompson from the symphony, and then Mr. Balawatcher from Carnegie Mellon. You need a mentor uh, to guide you. You know, um, like I said, there's very few Mozarts. Um, it, it was Jackie Kelso who told me one day, he said uh, he had this very in interesting way of talking. He was very sophisticated. He's actually on the Steely Dan record Asia in the saxophone section. Look look on the record. It says Jackie Kelso. He's on thousands of recordings. You know, uh, He lived in a trailer outside of the studio. There was so much work. That's a true story. <laughs> it's been verified. He told me that. I asked Plas Johnson later. He said, yep, he lived in this trailer. They would beep it, beep the beeper. There was no cell phones, remember? And he would mm. go in the studio to record a session. <laughs> One day, Jackie said to me, he said, you, you have more than enough technique to work the rest of your life. But what you're missing is the dance. There's no dance in your playing. So he, he, and what he, he told me, he said he played with Dizzy Gillespie when he was young and Lionel Hampton. And he said Dizzy was the first person who first talked about that to him. He, he, he said, you know, when, when you're playing, it's got to have dance in the music. And then my brother, I remembered later, told me the same thing about Beethoven and Mozart. He reminded me of much of that was, was played for people who were dancing, that sometimes we were listening to the music in the wrong way. Sometimes he, he said, if you take Beethoven and instead of tapping on one and three, put it on two and four and listen to it, you're going to hear a much different concept of what Beethoven was doing. Because even, even in the symphonies, honestly, there's dance going on. Uh, music has always served a function. Music has rarely ever been something that people sat down and listened to. It's always either a religious thing, a communication thing, uh, a spiritual moment, a celebration. It, music has not been like what it's become lately where people sit at a concert. And that's why I think so many people love rock concerts and pop concerts, because you're participating in the party. You know, after when people start to sit in a chair and look at music, it's never been our history of, of, of doing that. Uh, and Mozart had to write a lot of stuff for the king and queen, remember? But the common people weren't listening to Mozart, <laughs> right? They were listening to the local folk music. They had no interest in listening to that. Um, I got sidetracked for a minute. You got to bring me back. When... <laughs> so, yeah, you, you've got to have that dance. The dance. And I, I... Hmm. I think that's something that jumps out about the, the Basie Orchestra too, isn't it? That it's always that spirit of dance that it well, influences. Jackie told me about the dance. And then and just in the last five years, 
the great Houston Pearson. He, he's a, a saxophonist recorded about 50 records. Very, very, very long longevity in this business. I met him years ago. So one day on, on the phone, he said to me, he said, he said, Marshall, you know, the, the secret to music is melody, dance, and swing to jazz music. And he actually said the Count Basie Orchestra was always more popular than the Duke Ellington Orchestra, though the Duke Ellington Orchestra has some of the most sophisticated music in the world. But he said what Count Basie had figured out to do was always have melody, dance, and swing. And so when you went to a Count Basie concert, people say it's like going to a party, right? It's like having fun. You leave feeling like you, that, that you had fun. Uh, Honestly, sometimes I think that's missing from a lot of a lot of jazz music today. That that feeling of the party and the dance and the fun. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about the Count Basie Orchestra. You've been an alumnus for twenty years um, in various sax chairs, and I'd love to know where that came into your own musical journey, and also, uh, I guess what what's so distinctive about that orchestra in particular, that mm. band. <laughs> Well, the, the, Count, the Count Basie Orchestra is one of the most singularly most uh, influential big bands to the way every big band plays in the world today. Um, <laughs> that's, that's simply a fact. Uh, what, what the Count Basie's genius was coming up with this style and sound, which has pretty much stamped every single big band you were here today. It's hard to listen to any recording that you find today and not be able to find some kind of Count Basie influence on it. That's the most important thing. So when I was at college, going to school, and I, I was playing lead out though, and I could read good, so that was, and I had a good sound, you know, for my studies. And uh, uh, Joe Williams was a guest artist. Nathan Davis brought in a lot of people to come into the school, and so I was playing lead out though, and. Uh, and my buddy and I, he, he wanted to study arranging. So since he liked arranging, he liked listening to big bands. So we would drive around in his truck through Pittsburgh, and he'd have, like, Count Basie on all of the time. You know, so we're listening to Count Basie, and Joe Williams was a guest. We're playing the part, and uh, Joe stops the band and says, Oh, the saxophones, you know you're not playing that right. Like, the, play like this guy here, this guy in the front right here, so, which was the biggest compliment I felt I had ever got, right? So... So that was my first thing. Now, my brother reminded me later, which I don't remember. My brother said, you know, you told me one day, you said, I want to play in the Count Basie Orchestra. And he said, you know, you did it, you know, so you should be proud of yourself. Uh, the, the Count Basie Orchestra is like a living organism. We don't play what's on the paper. I've heard a lot of people play Count Basie music, but it doesn't sound like Count Basie. Um there's an interpretation to the music going on to the way the band plays. The one thing that Mr. Basie had members that stayed a long time in the orchestra. That's very important. Uh, I, I got to meet so many of them when I first subbed in the band in 1994, Frank Foster brought me in and there were a lot of the, you know, the Count Basie original from playing with Count Basie there. And, um, Danny Turner was the one who told me, cause I asked them a lot of questions about playing lead out though. I was sitting beside him one day playing, uh, second outdoor or something and uh he was saying that the the style was passed uh there's two count basic bands by the way there's the first generation one you know with earl warren playing lead out though and then the band kind of went out of business then the, the the second generation which is what most people know but frank foster frank west al gray that band so that that's most of the music people know uh, so Marshall Warren was the lead alto player. And as you know, Marshall had a, a, a very unique style of, of the lip slurs and the gasandos, the first thing into the notes, and the vibrato. What's fascinating about Marshall is that he added all that himself. It's not on the music. It, it was his voice. Uh, so uh, one of the great players that sat underneath him at first was Bobby uh, a Plater. And and then Danny Turner was sitting, at, sitting beside Bobby later. So Danny explained to me what happened was that Marshall was in the band a long time. So we all learned from Marshall. Bobby learned by sitting next to Marshall. I learned by sitting next to Turney, to, by, by, to, to Bobby. And then I got to sit next to Danny, and I was listening to him play the way he interpreted the music. Now, when I took over lead alto, John Williams said to me that he said that, you know, you're playing lead alto. This is, this is, you know, the most important thing that you need to know. Two things: you need to sing, 
and you need to have fun. And then Bill Hughes, the great Bill Hughes that played in the band some 54 years and led the band, he told me that it's really great that you love Marshall Royal, but what I want you to do is I need you to put your own voice on that chair to find your own way of playing it. And when you talk of singing there, we're not talking about the kind of singing we were talking about before in terms of creating your solo by singing out loud. You mean kind of singing through the instrument? Is that right? Yes, Being that's correct. With it? At all, all, all musicians that sing through the instrument, they, they need to get back to singing through the instrument and stop thinking of how many notes they can play and how many patterns they can play. Uh, music is about singing and touching people. Music should be listenable. Uh, music should move someone. You should tell a story. Um, it, it, it's not about impressing someone with how many patterns that you've memorized, because anyone can do that, clearly. Everyone in the world has learned the jazz method. That's the method I told you about memorizing patterns and scales, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but how many great musicians are there? And I mentioned David Sandborn, Sandborn before. Michael Brecker loved David Sandborn. James Moody said he loved I, I met David several times now. He's one of my favorites because David can say more with one note than most people would say with a series and flurry of a whole bunch of notes. And what he's doing is he's soulful, he's singing, it's melodic. But if you listen to his playing, it's always like you would sing. He's always singing. In history, the people that have lasted the longest were singing. As complicated as John Coltrane became, you can still sing even the most complicated parts of a solo. It was still beautiful. And that's, I know you said you have a lot of, of middle ground amateur musicians. And that's why I go back to if you want to learn a song, don't buy the music. Pretend you're a guitar player. If you play sax or piano or trumpet or guitar or bass or whatever it is, Nowadays, get the MP3 and listen to it. The way that we learn a song is we sing it first, and then we try to play it on our instrument by picking out one note at a time. That's how guitar players learn how to play. And that's why, like, Joe Walsh and those guys sound so different, you know. And, and that's why rock and roll took over, to tell, to tell you the truth, you know. So Miles Davis figured that out. But if you listen to Miles Davis, first he loved rock and roll. He loved Jimi Hendrix, and he, he loved Sly and the Family Stone. But Miles was always singing when he played, if you listen to his playing very carefully. Miles said once he knew the words to all of those songs he was playing. Amazing. I think that's given such a fascinating insight into the mind of a, a top-level jazz performer and improviser. I, I've really loved hearing how you think about these things, because you know, there's so many musicians confused about what it takes to improvise or, you know, the balance between theory and ear and memorizing and preparing versus spontaneity. And I, I think you've given a really great picture of how you think about all this. I, I think for the person who's beginning to improvise, they need to go back to the beginning of jazz or, 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 or something like that to improvise. And basically in New Orleans, what people were doing was they were taking a melody and then they were slowly changing the melody by ear. That should be the first way everyone learns how to improvise. If you have a teacher that shows you play one, two, three, five, or something like that, that's the wrong way to go about it. Because now you're memorizing notes. So you, you should take a song like, for instance, as Winston Marcellus has demonstrated over and over again at his clinics. You take a song like Happy Birthday. And then the second time, you just change Happy Birthday a little bit. You just make stuff up. If you make a mistake, it's okay. You know, you're practicing. You know, that's the whole idea. If you can't think of anything to play, just try changing a couple notes. You know, you might go, first time you go, Happy Birthday, da, 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 da. Now you say, I, I don't really know what to do. So the next time maybe go, Da 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 da. We say, "Oh, that's pretty good." What else can I do? What about you go? Da 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 da. You added one note. Da 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 da. So how do you find those notes? You sing it first. You have to start singing, whatever you're doing, and you gotta have fun. You gotta have make this fun, and then like an hour goes by in no time at all. And that's how everyone should start to improvise, by ear first, not by theory first. 
it, it's kind of backwards. Love it. We recently added our improv modules inside Musical U, and I think I'm going to go back and put in a big quote that says, Marshall McDonald says, sing first and have fun, <laughs> because that is exactly <laughs> the right spirit to take to it. I love it. So, Marshall, we've talked a bit about your playing with the Count Basie Orchestra, and I've been loving your two solo records, or not solo, but um, Under Your Own Name, Standardize, and Mama Knows Everything. What else is going on in the world of Marshall McDonald? You're clearly a, a very, very um, fluent educator in explaining what you do as well. Is that part of what you do these days? Yes, that, that really is my goal. I would like to settle down and, and teach and, and, and possibly even teach at a college or teach Skype lessons. And, and um, like I said, I've, I've been so lucky. I, I, I only touched upon what a few, few of the things people told me. Uh, I, I think the key for anyone, though, is to absorb what it is that people are telling you and always be humble. You know, don't act like I know everything and I'm not going to listen to this person because that's kind of silly. Um, so basically, I'm looking to teach. I've also been playing a baritone saxophone with Abdullah Ibrahim a lot lately. We're going to Paris uh, to Marciac coming up in August. Uh, Abdul is very interesting for me because, see, in the Basie band or any big band, you don't get a lot of time to solo. You know, but Abdul is using just four horns and I'm, I'm playing baritone sax. So, of course, there's a lot more solo space and a lot more freedom. Abdul encouraged all of us to start writing music and to start finding our own, own sound. And I think he's absolutely correct. Um, the music industry is changing a lot. Maybe maybe you're aware of that. Uh, what do you play? I play, play these days mostly bass. Um, I yeah, clarinet and saxophone in my past. Uh, these oh, days, gonna, bass, guitar. Get more work on bass. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone needs a good bass player. Um, the industry is changing a lot, you know, uh, and, and some things not not for the better. Uh, we do have a very advanced college education system and some very advanced saxophone players. I remember I heard Lee Konitz say 25, you know Lee Konitz, the great Lee Konitz, one mm -hmm. of the greatest jazz saxophonists of all time. It, he he came out of the, uh, the Lenny Tristano school. That was the school opposite of Charlie Parker. Lenny Tristano was a pianist in the 40s and 50s, Warren Marsh, uh, Lee Konitz, incredible music. You know, uh, uh, there would be no Paul Desmond without Lee Konitz. Uh, so once Lee said years ago, he said, he said, these kids have so much more technique than I ever will have. <laughs> you know? but, but, you know, so many times, so many of us would rather go. Well, Lee could play. He had technique, but I know what he means. You know, I, we would rather go listen to Lee Konitz. I was listening to Paul Desson play on what tune, live or Carnegie Hall. At, maybe it's called 11-4 or something like that. He wrote it where it's a time signature where, it's a, you know, it's 11 beats over four. But it, it was just so marvelous and beautiful. Besides being so such a mastery of a solo, it was also wonderful to listen to. And, and that's kind of been my thing lately, telling people that uh, the jazz sometimes has gotten so educated with everyone knowing every John Coltrane lick and every pentatonic scale and wanting to impress the other musicians that the audience, they didn't notice, walked out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> Because in Pittsburgh, the way it was, when you, it was about being in a bar. You know, you're looking at steel workers. They had a hard day at work. Maybe they got some trouble at home. They're coming down there to relax and have a good time. They don't want you educating them with the deepest John Coltrane thing you had. The bit that what used to get people shouting in the bar was when you played a blues lick in Pittsburgh. You know, like a, a, a you know, like say you're going along, you're like you're going like. Wow! Up and up and up and up, and the people go, ah, you know, and they're drinking, <laughs> they're smoking, and and, and, and see that that's what the, the Stanley Turn team came from Pittsburgh, right? And I heard a lot, and I got to meet Stanley when he came back to Pitt to to, to be a clin clinician, and Stanley had a prolific long career because he always played the blues, he always spoke to people. He and Mike, one of Michael Brecker's favorite players was Stanley Turn. You know, and, and Michael Brecker said he listened to guitar players. Did you know that? It, it, his focus was on a lot of guitar players. Um, I did get to speak with Michael Brecker a few times. I, I, I was very fortunate. I loved his playing from the late 70s. One of the first solos someone told me to learn was on um, Michael Brecker's solo on Don't Let Me Be Lonely Tonight by James Taylor. You know, I, I found a lot of young people didn't even know that he played the original sax solo on that song. I, 
you know, I guess I'm old. <laughs> but it, it, it's a beautiful solo. And again, because Michael's singing during the solo. You know, Michael played with Carly Simon, uh, James Taylor, Paul Simon, uh, you know, on, on the cameo, cameo, but record great solos if you listen to michael brecker solos all of the time on those pop records he's singing like macy o parker or hank crawford it's when i mean singing he's playing a phrase that's musical he's not playing notes that he's memorized so that but what what happens when you practice a lot of jazz and you learn your patterns and michael said he had a method in high school he, he Obviously, incredibly talented. His brother could play. Michael told me his method was writing down different patterns on music because he couldn't remember them. And then he would he would play them in different intervals and different sequences all over the saxophone front four hours after school. And then when he got to college to eight to 12 hours a day. So honestly, that there's no magic at all. You know, it, the, Everyone has a, a different gift. I agree with that. You know, um, and, and, and some people are most of us are not going to be John Coltrane or Michael Brecker, you know, so we have to accept that. But the, they're like our our sin, our sensei, our teachers, the masters that came and visited a little while and showed us here's the possibilities of what you might do, you know, <laughs> so, so, and, and uh, you, you get to grab a little bit from them. But what I. But still, what I first liked about Michael Brecker was the joy I felt listening to his music. So, again, I'm going to I'm going to go back to that. Every adult student, young student, if you're 40 years old, want to play saxophone. It's all about the joy of listening to the music. I love it. Well, you know, in the same way you were talking about looking up to those greats like Coltrane as a sensei or maybe a space alien that can inspire you, <laughs> I I just think it, it's a phenomenal day and age we live in that I have the opportunity to speak with someone like yourself at, at length and hear these amazing stories and insights, but also that, you know, an adult saxophone player or clarinet player who wants to study with you has that opportunity. You know, you're very generous with your time as an individual educator through Skype lessons and also through giving workshops. And I just think that's that's an amazing opportunity where you don't need to travel halfway around the world to study with today's greats. You can do it in the comfort of your own home. Um, so I, I definitely encourage anyone who's been inspired by today's conversation um, to head to Marshall's website. We'll have a, a link in the show notes, uh, but it's marshallmcdonald.com. And I just have to say a, a really big thank you. You've been so generous with your time today, Marshall, and it's been an absolute pleasure to get to speak with you. No, oh, thank, thank you so much. I've had a blast. Everyone keeps swinging and keep on enjoying the music, you know? Want to know how musical you are and how to improve? Find out free at musicalitypodcast.com slash checklist. Wow. I could have happily talked with Marshall for hours. And I'm hoping we can tempt him back for a part two or maybe a masterclass at Musical U, because I think this is a man that can get you straight to the heart of what really matters in music. I was particularly keen to pick Marshall's brains on the subjects of learning jazz and learning to improvise, because it's one thing to hear a top jazz educator tell you their answers, but it's quite another to have one of the best jazz musicians in the world tell you how they think about these things. I honestly didn't know for sure what Marshall would say, but... I was so happy to hear him say a few things really plainly. Firstly, apart from a few rare space aliens like Amadeus Mozart and Charlie Parker, the best musicians in the world didn't get there through talent or a gift. They got there by working hard and being open to absorbing lessons from the best teachers and mentors they could find. Secondly, when it comes to improvisation, it's not magic. There is learning and preparation, in the sense that knowing music theory and transcribing or memorizing licks and solos can give you a good foundation. But mostly, it comes down to listening and absorbing, and then equipping yourself with the knowledge and practice to translate what you want to say musically out into the world. Thirdly, it's about fun. Don't let those stories of 15-hour practice days put you off. If the lead alto for the Count Basie Orchestra got there by pursuing his love of music and enjoying exploring and learning, then your own music learning certainly doesn't have to be super dry and serious and rigid. There were a ton of insights and ideas packed into that conversation. I'll recap some that stood out to me, but this is definitely an episode you might want to listen to more than once. 
As a high school student, Marshall figured out for himself that the best way to write his solo was to sing it first. He had absorbed enough music by ear to know what would sound good. And singing first let him capture that, write it down, and then he could play it on his sax. That's such an important point, I think. Not just because it reiterates what we often say on the podcast and inside Musical You, that your singing voice is an amazing tool for developing your musicality, whether or not you consider yourself to be a singer, but because it really captures the source of improvising that Marshall explained in this conversation. It's not about starting from music theory and carefully using rules and logic to know what notes will sound good. There is value in those rules and knowledge. And Marshall certainly talked about that, the studying and transcribing and learning scales and chords and so on. But ultimately, for improvisation to connect with the listener and be true to your voice as a musician, it needs to come from inside first. So it's not that you're always going to be singing something out before you can write it down and then play it. It's that singing is the quickest route to taking the music you imagine in your mind and bringing it out into the real world. In due course, you can go straight to playing it on your instrument. And the theory and preparation can help a lot with finding the right notes with your fingers. I loved Marshall's exercise of alternating singing and playing each note of the scale and naming it by number. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you'll have recognized this as what we call the relative pitch or scale degree system of understanding notes by ear, where you use numbers or sulfur names to give each note an identity. And that lets you translate the notes you imagine or sing into a particular key and onto notation or your instrument. I also loved Marshall's comment about pianists breathing between phrases when they play. Even though they're not literally singing as they play, it's clearly connecting to that same instinctive way of expressing music with our voice. And he really emphasized the importance of lyrical playing or singing through your instrument. Because it's possible to convey more emotion with just one note that you play like singing. Than with a fast flurry of a dozen that are played robotically. A few times in the past, when I've interviewed jazz educators here on the podcast, I've asked them about this cultural thing where jazz is seen as super advanced or intimidatingly complex. And although I didn't ask Marshall that, I think his framing of it was wonderful that jazz is music, it's all music, and the best jazz musicians study classical and pop and rock. And that jazz was, and perhaps should be, all about dance. If the music doesn't have that dance ability to it, well, the audience might just walk out. That's something the Count Basie Orchestra is known for, always making their performances dance worthy. And that's clearly a big reason why they're so beloved by their audiences when they perform live or on a recording. I thought it was really interesting how Marshall recognizes both the value of studying the greats and transcribing by ear and learning the jazz method. But also sees improvisation as an activity that is absolutely accessible to beginners. His recommendation to start by creating variations on a melody, perhaps by using your voice rather than an instrument, is a really neat way to help you connect with your potential for improvising, especially if you're someone who's been intimidated or overwhelmed by it in the past. And I hope you didn't miss the bit where he said that it's okay to make mistakes. As I listen to Marshall talk about those incredible space alien senseis that may have a gift beyond our own, but who we can still learn from and be inspired by, I couldn't help but think that Marshall himself represents that to most musicians around the world. This is the man who's played in a legendary jazz band for 20 years, many of those playing lead, and who has worked with and learned from some of the best known and most respected musicians of the last 50 years. And so to hear him say, look, I wasn't an effortless prodigy, and no musician I know was. We've all studied and worked and pursued our love of music to get this good. Well, I think that's incredibly inspiring. And it really makes you wonder whether Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, or even Mozart or Beethoven themselves might have said exactly the same thing. I'll reiterate what I said at the end of the conversation that it's somewhat mind boggling to think that in this day and age, If you want to study with or be mentored by the greatest musicians in the world, that's actually often within reach. To take a single Skype lesson with a man like Marshall McDonald could transform how you approach learning music. And as was clear from this conversation, he is someone at the top of their game who can still explain things in a relatable way. And there should be zero intimidation factor because he clearly has a real respect for the passionate amateur musician and what they can accomplish. You can listen to Marshall's music, 
read his blog posts, and learn more about opportunities to study with him in person or online at his website, marshallmcdonald.com. And that's McDonald, M-C-D-O-N-A-L-D. And we'll have a direct link to that in the show notes for this episode at musicalitypodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where we'll be talking about a topic that's near and dear to jazz musicians' hearts, and is simpler than you might have been led to believe, and that's modes. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive.